You know who's a great person? James Kerchick. Yeah. He's with us, I believe, on Line Fun. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, he, formerly of the New Republic, uh, where he covered domestic politics, American foreign policy. Uh, you've, you also worked at Radio Free Europe. Well, that's awesome. Baker always talks about that all the time. You see his work in New York Sun, New York Daily News, The Hill, Washington Examiner. Um, visiting fellow at the Book Bookings Institution. He has got a great new book, Secret City. We've already been promoting the hell out of it. The Hidden History of Gay Washington. This is jaw-dropping. Available wherever fine things are sold. James, can you hear us? Can you hear hey, us? Hey, thanks for having me, Bill. Oh, thank you. Yes. And I, and I found out, and I, because I listen all the time to the fifth column, but after a while, the episodes pile up. I had forgotten, and then I subsequently remembered when we met at the Roosevelt House, always happy to give them a plug, that we have a mutual enemy and concerned with Michael Moynihan. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that was, I was very happy to hear about that. Um, he sends his best and then insulted me. I won't relieve the, I won't reveal the, twi the actual tweet thing he said. But how are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Mm. Brilliant idea for a book. Starts, I believe, with the Truman administration. Oh, no, I'm sorry, LBJ. I'm not LBJ, FDR, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yes. it goes, it's sort of the history of mostly hidden, um, uh, the, the gay history of D.C. from there all the way up to about Clinton. And uh, just some of the insights that you have, some of the things that you've uncovered is just unbelievable. Uh, what prompted this to begin with? Well, uh, I was uh, a junior at Yale University, and I was taking a class on the art of biography. And every week we would read, a, it was a seminar, and every week we'd read a biography. And the final project had to be a biography that we wrote of somebody else. The only conditions were that their papers had to be stored at the Yale archives. And so I chose uh, a man named Larry Kramer, sure. who died in 2020 at the outset of the pandemic. but a very famous um, playwright. He wrote The Normal Heart. He was an mm. AIDS activist. He was a gay activist, a very kind of loud, um, but very influential person. And he was a Yale graduate. He had graduated in the 1950s and he had just donated his papers to Yale. And so I chose him and I got, I was one of the first people to you know, work on his paper collection. I obviously interviewed him extensively for it. And Larry was very, you know, interested in gay history and in the role of gay people in history, in American history, uh, really beginning with the colonial era. And he was, you know, concerned that these stories were not told, that they had been hidden, that the material, uh, the evidence had been, you know, in many cases destroyed, or more often just ignored by mainstream straight historians who didn't consider, you know, gay stories and gay lives to be uh, legitimate. And he really kind of, you know, inspired um, an interest in this subject in me when I was in still a college student. And then after I graduated Yale, I moved to Washington, D.C. to work at the New Republic magazine, and I was covering politics extensively. And I was thinking about writing a book, um, as one does. And it just seemed that um, I mean, I, I've always been very interested in Cold War history in, in this period of time in, in American history. And it just seemed that, you know, homosexuality played such a significant but often sort of unspoken, hidden role behind the scenes in a lot of um, events and phenomena throughout this period, uh, really beginning with FDR um, and the rise of sort of the national security state in, the, in, in America. And then going really all the way through to the end of the Cold War with, with the Clinton administration. So that's why I chose those two presidencies as the uh, bookends of, of this book. And the more research I did, it was just sort of eye-opening, just all the, the many kind of surprising ways in which homosexuality, but more specifically the fear of homosexuality, uh, the role that it played in uh, American history. It's um, unbelievable. Speaking of your research, what did you find to be the most useful or helpful when doing the research? Was it personal letters, diaries, and not only the most helpful, but like the most truthful? Yeah, I would say um, the two biggest sort of scoops in the book 
Uh, one involves a man who was an aide to Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson. Uh, his name is Bob Waldron. And he was a pretty close aide. He wasn't senior. He wasn't like a policy advisor, but he was a stenographer. You know, he would sit in on all the meetings and take notes and he would travel with John. This is when Johnson was Senate Majority Leader and then Vice President. He would travel with him around the world, go to meetings with you know foreign dignitaries, kings and queens and whatnot. He was in the room with Johnson throughout a lot of these experiences. And then after the Kennedy assassination, as Johnson was preparing to move into the White House, Waldron had to undergo a security background check. And it was in that background check that it was discovered that he was gay. And he oh. immediately lost his job. He was kicked off the White House grounds. They took away his pass. And that was it. That was the end of his political career. This story had never been told before. Amazing. Um, and the reason is because Bob Waldron didn't want anyone to know. You know, he just sort of, he, he found a new career as an interior decorator, but he didn't want anyone to know about this, why he had to stop working for Johnson. He died in the 90s, Bob Waldron did. I found this story uh, because I got his FBI file declassified. It was the oh, FBI wow. and, the civil, and, the, and the Civil Service Commission, which is which was the body that was responsible for basically all of federal employees. They were the two agencies that launched investigations into him. And the file was over a thousand pages. I mean, they interviewed dozens of people. Um, and you, and it, was, it was just fascinating. You know, you start at the beginning of the file and you read all these interviews that they did with former neighbors and, you know, colleagues and people who went to school with him. And they're all saying wonderful things about him. He's a patriotic American and whatnot. But then they interviewed one guy, you know, and that goes on for hundreds of pages, right? So I'm reading this guy's life story. But then they interviewed one man whom Waldron had made a pass at. And that was it. Uh, that was, that was the end of his political career. Um, and so that, you know, that 1,000 page FBI file, uh, it held an entire, you know, that was like two chapters worth of my book, you know, what I was able to glean from that. Um, and then the next big scoop that I had involved um, a story, a uh, scandal really, that was never reported involving Ronald Reagan. It was the summer of 1980, just a couple of weeks before he was nominated by the Republican Party to be president. And there were a group of Republican congressmen who were liberal to moderate re Republican congressmen who didn't like Reagan because he was from the right of the party. He was the, the conservative in the, he was leading the conservative movement. They brought a sort of a series of allegations to Ben Bradley, who was the legendary editor of the Washington Post. He was the one who led the Post through Watergate and the Pentagon Papers. They brought uh, basically like a manila folder full of, um, you know, allegations that Ronald Reagan was being controlled by a cabal of right-wing homosexual advisors. And that this dated back to when he was governor of California. Um, and there was even an allegation that Reagan might've been gay himself. And the Washington Post investigated this. Ben Bradley assigned Bob Woodward and some other top-notch reporters to investigate it. They went out across the country. They interviewed a number of people who were named in these allegations. And they turned up uh, that it was true that there were a number of gay advisors around Reagan. They could not find any evidence that there was some kind of nefarious cabal, or more importantly, that any of these men were gonna hold you know, jobs in the White House or the administration that would have required a security clearance. This story I found in Ben Bradley's papers. You know, we go back to oh my, my god, we, we go back to my interest. You know, with Larry Kramer and going through his papers. You know, that kind of bred in me a real fascination in working in archives. And you can find amazing thing in our things in archives. You know, just because they're old, yeah, uh, collecting mm. dust. You know, does not mean that they don't have fascinating new information in them. So I found you know, all the notes of this Washington Post investigation. You know, Bob, the transcript of Bob Woodward's. Uh, his notes of, of, of interviewing people. I found the original, you know, like 37 point memo that these congressmen had typed up for Bradley, you know, laying out this entire, you know, complicated cons gay conspiracy. It was all in Ben Bradley's papers and no one, you know, the, the Post did not run a story on this. They never published anything about it. Wow. And so I went and I interviewed some of the reporters who were still alive, who, you know, who did talk to me about it. Bob Woodward didn't talk to me, which I can understand because uh, you know, as a, as a as a journalist, the conversation he had was was I think off the record with 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 the person involved. So he felt that he didn't want to talk to me, but I talked to other people about it, and that's that's all in the book. 
Unbelievable. And as far as I was concerned, it was all scoops because I didn't know any of this yeah. stuff. And this is like the particular part of uh, American history that I'm always fascinated with, particularly when it relates to the presidents. And I, all of this stuff surprised me. Getting back mm. to Reagan, I did not know that while governor, I mean, and you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, why he was hypersensitive of it. A, because yeah. of the reputation Hollywood had at the time. B, yeah. because he mentions in his memoir that he bristled at the fact that he had to play Betty Davis's uh, gay friend gay at one point. Mm. Yeah. Which they say but don't say because it was Hollywood back yeah. then. But more yeah. specifically, as governor, he had a lot of aides, uh, aide-de-camps, whatever you want to call it, that would rent out a place and have orgies in. Uh, well, uh, under his watch or something. I'm, I'm probably butchering that, but it was something that, along that was, those lines. That was the accusation. There was okay. there was a newspaper columnist who reported that in 1967, less than a year into Reagan's governorship. Um, and it's still unclear to this day if that orgy ever happened. It, you know, it, the, the, the sourcing on this was not um, entirely, you know, uh, up to snuff. But right. Reagan did fire two aides because accusations like this were brought to him that they were gay. So he did fire two men because of it. So yes, there was a sensitivity around this issue, uh, and, also because of the Hollywood connection, um, uh, and just this perception that you know maybe there was something a little light in the loafers about him. Right? He was an actor. Um, he had played this role in the, in, in the 1939 movie Dark Victory with Betty Davis, where the the director asked him to play. In so many words, he asked him to play gay, and he and he really bristled at that. that. Um, so yeah, there was this, this was, there was this real sensitivity around this this issue of homosexuality, which I do think, sadly, probably played a role in the Reagan's um, the the administration's really kind of slow response to the AIDS epidemic. Is DC more blunt than the tabloids? Like back in the day, um, I I believe uh, one of your subject matters was actually plastered on the cover of it. Uh, I think in the fifties or sixties for one of the one of the scandals. But like back in the day, it would be they would use code words like affirmed bachelor. Yeah, uh, and things like that. Were they more blunt in D.C.? If you were being spoken about in circles about whether or not you had suspicions, would they just say, oh, he's gay? Or, like, did they have their own little code words? Like, as far as the time was concerned, what was hidden and what wasn't, were there any type of euphemisms and stuff like that that you, yeah. that you discovered? Well, yeah, one of the many things I discovered is all the many euphemisms that people would use to describe homosexuality, because even that word homosexuality was considered taboo. So, yeah. you know, I, 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 I write about the first outing in American politics, which was of a, a senator from Massachusetts named David Walsh. It was in 1942. The New York Post accused him of frequenting a male brothel in Brooklyn. Um, and this caused a huge uproar in the Senate and the FBI launched an investigation. And they actually found out that it was a case of mistaken identity, that Walsh was not, was not there. He probably was gay. Uh, but that's beside the point. But the Senate Majority Leader at the time, he was discussing these allegations, and he just um, a crime too loathsome to be mentioned in the presence of men and women in the Senate. That's how he would describe it. Right? He couldn't actually utter the word mm. homosexuality. Um, so you have this, I mean, there's the famous you know, term that came up during the Oscar Wilde trial, the love that dare not speak its name. Okay. Um, yeah. There are multiple. Yeah, there are multiple mentions of you know the crime too loathsome to be mentioned, you know the crime against nature. Um, so yeah, there's lots of euphemisms that people would would come up with, and it required on my part a lot of kind of just detective work, or sort of reading between the lines to see what people were were, were discussing. Well, sort of to that point, when you're reading between the lines and you're doing your research. You know, I kind of view it like if you're a girlfriend looking at a boyfriend's text messages because you think he's doing something dirty. Sometimes if you want to find something, you do. You know, it's like if, if you go yeah. in with the mindset that I'm going to find him cheating, you might conflate things or, or mold things to your opinion. How, yes. do, how do you keep yes. from yes. doing that when doing your research? Well, I'll give you an example. I mean, J. Edgar Hoover is a character who looms very large. We were just talking show. about him before the show. I was like, oh, yeah. he disappointed me so much about the, the cross dressing thing and everything like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, well, there's actually there's there's a new biography out about Hoover. It just came out a couple of weeks ago, which looks like, it looks to be the definitive biography. Um, and yes, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence 
that J. Edgar Hoover was gay, right? He was a lifelong bachelor. He had a very close relationship with his deputy at the FBI, uh, Clyde Tolson. Um, they traveled together, they ate lunch together every day. They, you know, there are photos of them looking very affectionately at one another. Do were um, they buried together? I believe no, their they're plots buried are right several, next to they're several plots away from okay. each other. Okay. At, at Congressional Cemetery, um, which is actually the epilogue of my book. Um, but, you know, as a historian, you know, it's not my role to speculate. I can, I can present you with the evidence and I can um, show you what, what exists and what's true, what we know for a fact. But as far as, you know, declaring that J. Edgar Hoover was a homosexual, I don't, no one has the evidence to be able to say that. Sure. We can, we, we can say that there was lots of signs of it, right? And that um, in many cases like this, when people are so close to one another, we sort of assume that maybe they're gay, but, you know, in the absence of a kind of, of, of solid evidence or a kind of declaration of it, I don't feel comfortable doing it. So that, that to me is probably the biggest example of that technique at work. But there's lots of this you see throughout the book, um, a real kind of just sort of conspiratorial attitude towards homosexuality, this belief that, you know, gays are lurking everywhere, or if there's, you know, if there's two of them in a room together, then it must mean that there's some kind of conspiracy. You know, that we just talked about the Reagan um, example, but, you know, during the 1950s, there was something called the Lavender Scare, which was uh, concurrent with the Red Scare, where thousands of, not just gay people, but anyone suspected or really accused of being gay would lose their job. Um, and there was often very little evidence for it. You know, it, people would say, oh, like they, this guy, you know, my, my boss, he walks funny or he talks with a lisp or right. his very delicate hands or, you know, all these kinds of stereotypical uh, traits that we associate with homosexuality, those would be cited in a lot of these these cases. So um, you see, it's, it's a recurring feature of homosexuality in politics. Well, and then um, with regards to the lavender scare, and also, like, I go back to that one aide of uh, FDR's, and I love the Summer line, that, yeah, the, with the line that you repeat, like, FDR would forgive anyone if they were doing something while drunk. But oh. this guy was, uh, was uh, very... Um, was very much against anti-Semitism. And had we yeah. not lost him because of the scandal, maybe we would have been better with uh, taking in more Jews during World War II. There's lots of instances like this. I mean, are there just glaring examples of talent that we lost, brains that we lost because of this clapdown that really, you know, went on well, well into the Reagan administration? Uh, yeah. That, I mean, it must have just been heartbreaking. You must have just seen example after example of the nation being less safe, less competent, all of that because of uh, the constant weeding out of people either perceived to be gay or not uh, in yeah, D.C. I mean, there's, there's one story I tell of a man named Frank Kameny who was a Harvard-trained Ph.D. astronomer who was working for the Army Map Service, which was the predecessor to the Geospatial Intelligence Agency, uh, in December 1957. Sorry, October, yeah, December 1957, just two months after Sputnik was launched, right? So we're right at the height of the space race. And he was working at an observatory in Hawaii and he was summoned back to Washington. He was fired on the spot because he was gay. And it says something about the yeah. fear of homosexuality, right? That the federal government would fire someone at the height of the space race, who's a Harvard trained PhD astronomer. He's working in the military, basically for the military wing of the space program. Um, that they would fire him because he was gay. That it was more important to them to get rid of a homosexual than to use this person's talents in our competition with the Soviets. And yet they hired um, Nazis. You know, that, and they, yeah. and, yeah, that, that's the most well, amazing and, thing. And to this point, everyone thing we're talking about, a topical news story, which I did send to you, the yeah. James Webb Space oh, yeah. Telescope won't be renamed following an investigation into government discrimination. So James Webb was a top official in the State Department and later NASA when LGBTQI plus employees were excluded and fired from the workforce. But the space agency said its investigation found that Webb was not complicit in the actions. So you then told me some of your research was used in, in, in figuring all of this out. Will you tell me about that? Yeah, so NASA just released a report um, on this. And it's just important to know who James Webb was. He, he had been a kind of minor functionary in the State Department at the start of the Lavender Scare. And then he was the administrator of NASA 
really th at, 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 th through NASA's like glory days in the 1960s. Um, and there was, a, there was a move to remove his name from this telescope uh, because of his so-called complicity in the Lavender Scare. The problem is, is that pretty much every government official from Harry Truman to Bill Clinton, you could say, for on down, from the president on down to kind of the lowest level, really, you know, anyone who had a role in sort of overseeing employees, pretty much everyone was complicit in the Lavender Scare, right? I mean, uh, this was a government-wide policy that was pursued with extreme prejudice in every branch of the federal government. I mean, you couldn't get a job at the Smithsonian Institution, mm. right? Wow. I mean, any job in the federal government. There, there were gay people who worked there, right? But they had to do so covertly. But the point is, is that this was a this was a wide ranging policy. Um, and so I think to single out James Webb, you know, who this report says he wasn't directly involved in a firing, which is I'm sure true. It was below his pay grade, right? He's the administrator. Yeah. He's not dealing with these low level personnel issues. Um, I think it's the right decision not to take his name off this telescope, because as in any of these decisions with renaming things, do you have to look at, um, do this person's contributions to history outweigh the negatives, right? And, you know, George Washington owned slaves. Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. We as a society have, you know, we, we still believe that their contributions outweigh the evil of owning slaves. You know, I'm not sure where we're going to be in 20 or 30 years, the way things are going on certain no kidding. elements in our country. There are, there are, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a Democratic presidential candidate in the next 20 or 25 years advocating that we actually remove George Washington's name from the Capitol and other places. I don't think that's beyond the realm of possibility. That's a whole other debate. Oh, you're absolutely right. Think, huh? Oh, you're absolutely right. I mean, you yeah, see I mean, scenes of it everywhere. That, we're moving in that direction. Right now, it seems most people think that's crazy to do that, right? But we're moving in that, there, there's a swath of this country that is moving in that direction, that we need to, you know, erase from history all these figures um, because they weren't as enlightened as we are now in 2022. But no one is innocent. Right. Like you're gonna rename it no for another right. person right. and then we're gonna find right. out later that they did something evil. Right. So my problem with this James Webb thing is, is it actually minimizes the impact of the Lavender Scare to single out this one guy, yeah, who really whose whose role in it was minor, and it and it makes it seem as if like he was the one who was responsible for this when it was actually a government wide policy that every president, you know, up until Bill Clinton was in some way enforcing this these discriminatory policies against gay people. So I actually think it's a, it's a cross purposes um, of of the people who claim to care so much about this and who claim to care about commemorating this awful chapter in our history, I don't think it's helping the cause to be changing the name of this telescope. Yeah. What surprised you, uh, made you uh, change your perception of the person while doing the research for this book? I'm thinking of uh, these days, I like for a while he was almost forgotten by history. And then you got Roy Cohn uh, <laughs> they, when he was with McCarthy and then he was Trump's lawyer and Trump's sort of his whole playbook for everything really goes back to yeah. what Roy taught him and everything like that. And then all of a sudden, of course, you got angels in America and then there's that sweeping uh, documentary about him on HBO that was pretty fascinating. Yeah. Now he comes off yeah. as this pretty, um, you know, uh, just a, tra a traitor to his own people. And he doesn't come off yeah. well. But if not, maybe Roy no. Cohn, but somebody like him that that you thought was all bad or thought was all good, and something in, in the research sort of surprised you about them. Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, there's one story I tell about Jerry Ford. Um, who, in you know, 1975, there were two assassination attempts on Ford. Um, and the second one in San Francisco, his life was saved by a gay man. Oh, uh, I didn't who, know that. Yeah, who stuck his arm out and he pushed the assassin's hand down. His name was Oliver Sippel. And it was a tragic story because the newspaper outed him. And he was not out to his family oh, uh, back home in Michigan. And it really ruined his relationship with his family, and he drunk himself to death. But and he was a he hero. <laughs> yeah. He was a hero. And, you know, it took, it took a couple days for the White House 
to like issue a statement thanking him. Um, he wrote him, you know, Ford wrote him a letter. Um, and then it's interesting, Sipple wrote back and he basically said, Mr. President, you know, I didn't seek the limelight. I did what any patriotic American would do. Um, but this has ruined, you know, the, the newspapers, they've reported this and it's really kind of destroyed my relationship with my family. Would you mind just like maybe calling my mother? The, by the way, his, his mother gave a comment to the newspaper where she's like, you know, we were very proud of Oliver for saving the president's life. And then we heard he was gay. And now it's, you know, Jesus now Christ. I don't want to see him again. It was really terrible. Ugh. And he asked for, he asked for to kind of call his parents. Um, and Ford never responded. You know, I'm not sure uh, if that's the role of, of the president of the United States. Kind of, mm. He's obviously a very busy guy. Um, but, you know, it would have taken five minutes to maybe, you know, maybe call Oliver Sipple's parents and say, hey, you know what? It's not it's not for me to tell you your views on homosexuality. But, you know, your son saved my life. He saved the life of the president. And it would have been an enormous tragedy. You know, it's not that long since President Kennedy was assassinated. It would have been it would, it would have been terrible for our country. I don't need to tell you. You know, I, I don't want you to, I just want you to know how proud I am of your son. I don't know. Maybe that would have changed things. I don't know. And again, it's one thing to be annoyed by all the favors you have to do as a president, but it's another one when the guy, the favor in question is for someone that just saved sure. your life. You know, yeah. I, I feel like it could probably yeah. schedule in something along those lines. Uh, do you have any one, like one last quick story you want to give? Well, I, do, I have a question actually. In any of your research, did you find that anyone who was in, who was uh, like closeted, um, who maybe helped the government because of their sexuality, like maybe mm. gay honey trap or something like that. D did you come across any instances like that? There was the, the spy the, in World War II. I like right before the Night of the Lawn Knives, there was a little something like that, right? Uh, there was a gay spy um, in the OSS, which was the predecessor of the CIA, the Office of Strategic Services. His <laughs> name was Donald Downs. And he was involved in the tapping of the neutral embassies during World War II here in Washington. So the Spanish embassy, the Vichy French, not the Vichy, the, the, the French embassy. Um, and in order to sort of infiltrate the Spanish embassy, he recruited a bunch of very handsome young men to basically seduce the secretaries. Uh, and, that, nice. and, and that was how they kind of got access to the, the cipher codes. So they could decipher all the secret messages going back and forth. Uh, I mean, you know, one of the gay men around Reagan who I read about, that was a, a man named Peter Hannaford. Um, and he was instrumental in actually helping to persuade Reagan in 1978 to come out against a ballot initiative in California that would have banned gay people from teaching in public schools. He arranged, he brokered a meeting between Reagan, who was the, at that point, the former governor, preparing to run for president. He brokered a meeting between Reagan and one of the the gay activists who was fighting the measure, and they were able to persuade Reagan to come out against that ballot initiative. And they actually, that was actually the decisive endorsement. It was Reagan, Reagan opposing this. It was, it was going to win according to the polls, but then Reagan came out against it and the polls just flipped. Wow. So there's, there, there are stories like that of, of people who were closeted, right? Who decided that they were going to try to stay in the government, that they weren't going to take the risk of coming out. Um, and in some cases, like, you know, Roy Cohn, obviously they, committed, you know, evil acts, yeah. right? But there were other people who had a more complicated decision to make. And, you know, I think it's easier for us in this day and age to kind of fault people who, who were closeted. Um, but it was really, it was enormously difficult in this period of time uh, that I cover in the book. I mean, there are very few openly gay people at all, really in any sectors of society, and certainly not in American government. I mean, we didn't have the first openly gay congressman, you know, until 1983. Um, so I think people need to remember that, that, that it's only relatively recently that openly gay people have really been able to fully participate in, in American politics. It's going to be eye-opening for the younger people that are uh, grabbing this book to see how bad things really used to be. But listen, uh, well done. This was unbelievable. Um, please let us know when next you're in New York City. We'd love to get you uh, um, <clears throat> on the panel to talk about um, more silly stuff than this. But um, this is great. Uh, I got a lot for Christmas. It was great for my upper body, walking them home at the <laughs> Roosevelt. Um, anything else you want to plug? Anything? What, what are you working on now? Anything to look for, we can look forward to? Uh, I write for Tablet Magazine, um, and I'm working on some other book projects, but I can't reveal them at this point. So mm, you're just going to have to follow me on Twitter at Jay Kerchick. It's right there on the screen. So 
Can't thank you enough. Uh, really Thanks, appreciate guys. it. Hopefully we'll see you soon.